right, I've hit record. So, and I'm going to actually go ahead. Um, I'm going to keep letting people in. So if I talk like I'm doing playing a solitaire game, I'm not really, I'm just letting people in. <laughs> so, um, but I do want to go ahead and get started on time. If you're not muted, would you please mute yourself unless your name is Lynn Hannings? In a minute, I'll mute myself. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, welcome, because a lot of you guys are new to this. And um, those of you guys who have been coming to this series, welcome back. I'm so glad to see you all. And you you are being recorded. So you, I always tell everybody you've lost your opportunity to share your social security number. So now don't do that. <laughs> so, um, so these are called Classes for the Curious Musician. And we created them because at Hathmaker Valens, when COVID hit, we realized that our adult amateur musician friends um, had lost all their opportunity to play. No rehearsals, no summer camps, no recitals, no nothing. And we thought we needed something to get together and do stuff. Um, if you enjoy it, this is our, we did a series of eight before Christmas. This is our second series of eight. This is number seven. And um, they all live on the Huthmaker Violins YouTube channel. Um, and they're wonderful. We've had everything from practice techniques, how to memorize music easily, a violin maker, a conductor who was really cool, um, just all kind of neat things. If you're a playing musician, I think you'll really enjoy them. Um, and of course, there's no charge, I guess, on YouTube. There wouldn't be anyway, but um, we do it because we love music and we love our musicians more than anything in the whole world. I should say, I am Anna Huffmaker, and tonight, for the first time in months, I learned how to change my name on my screen, because <laughs> it usually says that I'm Dixie. Um, I am from Huffmaker Violins. If you are not in the Atlanta area, or even if you are, you know, we invite you, if you ever come through, come see us. We'd love to meet you in person, especially this crew, because a lot of you are my people. Um, I am the bow queen for our violin shop. I do all the bow stuff. and. Um, Mostly what you got to know about me is technic uh, when it comes to technological stuff, I'm not very good. So if we have some kind of issues or problems, I'll try and fix it. Um, just be patient with me if you would. So um, we're going to do things a little differently tonight. So as you have questions, I won't even say if, but when you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box, but we're going to save and hold all the questions for the end and let Lynn do her entire presentation. Um, and so, um, so Vernon is very excited that you're a bass player, Lynn. He is also a bass player. He's an awesome one. I heard he has an incredible teacher. I don't know who she might be, but, just <laughs> um, so one more th housekeeping thing. So next week is our last class in this series. Um, cellist Ann Hobbs is going to do, um, practice techniques, I think. And, um, if we haven't decided yet, if we're going to do a third series, if we do, though, if you have any ideas for classes that you would like, shoot me an email. You can go to Hethmaker Violins through our website, through Facebook page, through YouTube. I don't care how you get to me. Just get to me. And um, and I would love to hear from you. So you are all used to hearing me say that the best part of these classes was that I got to do all the hiring and hire all my favorite people in the planet. Mm -hmm. And um, and tonight, this is like one of my ultimate most favorite people. So um, all of my bow classes years ago that you've heard me tell stories about going to New Hampshire um, were taught by the wonderful Lynn Armour Handing, Handings. And, um, and like some of you may have already heard, she not only teaches, she's an incredible bow maker, of course, an incredible bass player, and she owns a business where she sells bow making and restoration tools. Um, she's kind of an... Bow Universe kind of a woman. So um, I am super proud to have her here and I'm really looking forward to this. So Lynn, welcome. And I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you have any questions, holler at me. Otherwise, I'm going to mute myself. So. Okay, Anna, I'm going to go straight to the PowerPoint presentation and then we can talk later. So I'm going to share screen. I know about as much as Anna does. And I'm going to pull up my pictures. And what else do I need to do? I need to go to slides. And from the beginning, 
And here we go. Now, can I move all of these little faces out of the way? Can I minimize all of you? Yes, I just did. Bye-bye. Okay, can you hear me? Can somebody hear me? Somebody hear? Okay. Yes. Okay, that's all I needed to know. Okay. Basis bowmaker, teacher, conservationist, sounds like a busy lady. I'm doing all of the things that I love, things that bring uh, pleasure and uh, real energy to my life. At the recent ISB, International Society of Basis Convention, they handed out these sweet, I don't wish I played the flute stickers, which I thought was just so wonderful because any of you who are bass players know that you hear all the time People come up to us and say, don't you wish you played the flute? And my answer is always no. I grew up in New York City and I had the opportunity to go to the young people's concerts uh, at the New York Philharmonic. Actually in public schools, we were able to go on field trips. And that was even before the days of the concerts being televised. I don't think we had a TV back in those days, uh, but I did hear and it was quite a surprise to me to hear a bass soloist. I had never, I was a kid, but I had never heard a bass play a solo before. And I had never heard anything ever in my life as beautiful as hearing Gary Carr play the block prayer. He was 20 at that time, which would have made me 10. And I fell in love with the instrument and I knew at that moment in time that I was going to be a bassist. However, Women in the bass world didn't have such an easy time of it. Uh, there weren't women bassists in the symphony orchestras. It was very rare. Uh, there were no auditions behind screens yet, but as soon as there was an audition behind the screen, Warren O'Brien on the far left got in. And that was, uh, that was not until 1966. But once she got in, that gave me the green light, the inspiration that if I worked hard, and went to Juilliard and studied with Fred Zimmerman that I too would have an opportunity to perform in a major symphony orchestra. That was my dream. Person next to her, my dear friend, Linda McKnight, followed that same pattern. She worked hard. She grew up in Northern New Jersey and she worked hard. We went to the same high school together and she studied with Fred Zimmerman, went to Juilliard, and then got a wonderful teaching job at the Manhattan School. And she was just a stellar teacher there until just a year or two ago when she retired. So these were my role models. And I knew if they could, they could do it and enjoy it and love it and keep it up for their entire careers, that that's what I wanted for me too. I put this little picture on the right of uh, Tracy Rowell working with a little girl on a base because I mentioned to you that I was 10 years old when I first saw Gary play. And that, for me, that would have been a perfect time to start lessons, except that there were no baby basses back in those days. There was just uh, the full size, the standard size bass. And so in order to play, you needed to wait until you were the right size. Well, I wasn't the right size until I was 13. And so there were three years in there when I was dreaming dreams of what I wanted for my life and I wasn't able to accomplish that. I did take piano lessons during that time, but that was pretty lame compared to playing the bass, which I thought was just the coolest thing in the whole world. And eventually I got there. I had uh, my bass was restored, just newly restored by a man up in Hastings on Hudson, uh, Joe Silicek. It's a beautiful Jacquet bass, and he had just restored it, and uh, he had, was fixing up an old bass for me that had been mine for a few years, and he said, I want you to try something. And I played this bass, and I fell in love with it, and I've had it ever since. And it's standing in this picture. It's standing at Barry Colstein's shop. Uh, it had a crack in the back two years ago now, one and a half years ago now, and um, I was so lucky, it was just before COVID, a month before COVID, and I was able to rush it down to New York and get it fully restored. And it just sounds better than it ever, ever has. So Barry, hats off to you for your fine workmanship on it. Every day I play it and every day it sounds beautiful. So thank you so much. Of course, if I was playing the bass, I needed to have my bow rehaired and I went to the local 
repairman. His name was John Roskowski. <clears throat> and he, I didn't know it at the time. I just thought he was a nice guy that lived in the next town over in New Jersey. But uh, he worked at Wurlitzer and he was part of this extraordinary photograph, this dream team of makers and restorers. <clears throat> He's the third in from the left in the back row, John Roskowski. But here we have Charles Beer and Sacconi and Bellini, Dattili, Nabel, Morel, Niagosian, so many remarkable, talented men who were working in that shop. Well, I think John saw me looking around his shop and realized that I had a real interest in it. And he offered to let me stay while he rehaired my bow. <clears throat> well, I knew at that moment that, again, it was clear that this is something I wanted to know more about, I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, get good at it. And he was really, really supportive of that and encouraged me over and over again to call Bill Salco and go, go talk to him about bows and learn something about bow making. I was on that track, that go to Juilliard study with Fred Zimmerman, get a great job and be happy for the rest of my life playing the bass. And then Fred Zimmerman died the year before I graduated from high school. He died quite suddenly of a heart attack, I believe. Um, I was shocked. It just, it blew my plans right out of the water. And so instead I went to New England Conservatory. I knew they had German boat players there. And I went and lo and behold, I had the opportunity to study with Gary Carr for two years, which was just such a, an incredible treat. I never imagined that he would be teaching at a conservatory. I thought he was just off being a soloist all the time. So two years with Gary and then two years with Bill Ryan, who was in the Boston Symphony. And this was another turning point in my life because these two guys who had studied with the same teacher, Reinschagen, they had similar left-hand techniques, but they had entirely different bows, different lengths, different height of the frog and the head, different weights, different balances, totally different bowing technique. And I was so curious about that and so interested at that point in time in knowing more about how bows are made. While all that was going on, I was still a student at New England Conservatory and I was, uh, as a student, going up to Portland to play in the orchestra. I loved it up there. So I started playing up there as a sub in 1969 and I'm still there to this very day. The picture on the left is an educational program that we have where we work to support the work of the classroom teachers. And then that's my, my family, my gang over there on the right hand side, special people. I did go to New York and study. The symphony schedule was uh, just October through April. And so for the rest of the year, I was able to go to New York, live with my parents and, and go in and study with Bill. But I was very nervous about calling him and asking if that would work. Uh, again, Johnny Roskowski was pushing me, pushing me. I finally just said, the next time you call me, I wanna know that you've spoken to Bill. So I, I did. I called Bill and I said, uh, my name is Lynn Hannings. I'm interested in making bows. I don't know a plane from a chisel. And he just laughed and he said, oh, that is just great. You have no bad habits. So I started my work down there. I had to make all my own tools, which was uh, some kind of torture. I didn't like that at all. Uh, but this is the first bow that I made. It's a cello bow, tort copy cello bow. And uh, Bill was a cellist at Juilliard before he started working for Wurlitzer and then eventually for himself. And so he was excited to play it for me, he told me to stand back and he drew the first note on the bow and the head broke off. Well, I was just devastated by that, but he just looked at me with this calm expression and he just said, I'll show you how to spline that. So I learned a repair, much to my horror. I was so, so upset. A little bit later, something special happened. The starting of the violin craftsmanship. Let me see if I can move that thing down. Yep. The starting of the violin craftsmanship institute at the University of New Hampshire. It was started by Carl Roy, who was the head of the violin making school in Mittenwald, Germany. 
He liked to come over to New Hampshire for his summer holidays, and he looked around for a place where he could have a school, just a, a bow, uh, an instrument making, violin making class. And sure enough, he came across the UNH Durham campus and loved it. And we have been there ever since in different buildings, but uh, we've been there ever since. Picture on the right is a, one of my favorite pictures of him. He was a really fine teacher. And this is a beautiful picture of one of his very talented students, Caitlin Pugh, who's now out in Portland, Oregon. Okay, I'm pushing and nothing's happening. Anna, can you unmute and tell me what's going on here? I don't know what's happening. Let me see if. Let me see if I can. If you can't get it unfrozen, Let's... then um, I can open. Is it working? No. I'm, I'm going to escape and then come back in with it. Okay. Sounds good. Now, even that's not working. Okay. So let's try this. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you guys. See what I mean about, you know, sometimes the, we have a little issue, um, but yeah, let me I just uh, keep this. going here for a second. You're going to fix it or I'm going to fix it. <clears throat> keep trying to fix it, but I do. I'm going to keep trying. I am going to keep trying and I'm feeling lucky. Ah, is it working for you? Nope. Um, that's okay because. Because you've got it I there. Can just make this. When you're in PowerPoint, how do you make it show just the picture, not the whole thing? Uh, you go up to the top. Mm -hmm. Did you, do you have it open up so? I do. Enlarge it. Okay. And then go to uh, slideshow across the top line. Mm -hmm. Slideshow. And then go to from beginning. Actually, and then we can. Okay. Um, from beginning. Is that you or me that we can see on your? Oh, I don't know. Whatever's happening, it's working. <laughs> so don't touch anything. Okay. <laughs> All right. So to continue, um, I started taking lessons. Uh, first off, they, the classes were just violin making classes. And then they started to grow. Arnold Bone came and did some repair classes. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I continued to go back and forth to New York with every spare minute that I had. But after a few years, Bill Salco was invited to come up and teach. And he was such a popular teacher. Uh, I think he has influenced bow making in this country more than any other teacher. It, he really did a remarkable job. And our classes at UNH were nine weeks in length, which is, um, I think, a real surprise to a lot of people. Not a one week or two weeks, but nine weeks. And I used to say to my family that I would leave my home in Maine in the late spring, and I wouldn't get back until the sumac was turning red, which would mean fall. So it was uh, it was a long a long time, but what an opportunity it was to learn. I was his teaching assistant. Whoops, come back here. I was a student for five years, and then I was his teaching assistant for ten years after that. And that picture on the left is me talking to Bob Stoltenberg, who uh, made a beautiful bass bow in memory of his wife who had died of MS a few years earlier. And then he gave it to me. And uh, it's such a beautiful bow. I, I still have it and use it all the time. I should just step back one more story. Uh, we used to, Bill and I used to get up every morning and at six o'clock in the morning, we would do a very fast circle walk around campus. It would take us an hour to get all the way around campus, but that was, something he wanted to do. And we had some great talks during that time. So then seven o'clock would come, he would get his shower and we'd have breakfast and then off to the class by eight o'clock. At five o'clock, we would go over to the bar, Tin Palace on Main Street. A uh, whole class would come along and we would have pitchers of beer and big tall pretzels. And at one of those, 
he said, you need to go to, you need to get a Fulbright scholarship. You need to go to France and complete your education. You're really good at this. I want you to go to France. So sure enough, I signed up for a Fulbright scholarship and got it. And an Annette Cadet fellowship, which is the French equivalent of the Fulbright scholarship. And the part of my education that was missing was the connection to the French school of bow making, the, the history of bow making, the individual makers and their individual styles. I didn't see that many great bows here in Maine. And so that really wasn't a part of what I had learned. I usually was stuck on, on purpose, either on doing a tort model or a sartori model, because those are the ones that I uh, really respected and, and wanted to perfect if I could. So I went to uh, work over there with Bernard uh, from in the, for the academic 89-90 academic year. And it was a fascinating time. We started with late model sartori bows, like the one that's pictured here, uh, and worked our way backwards. So basically, it was 1950 to 1750, going back uh, through all of the really significant makers. Every three weeks, I would change out a bow. I'd go get a bow. He was very generous with the bows from his collection. So I would get a bow and he would give me a, a whirlwind history lesson on it that I, I can remember a fraction of it because he was so quick and so energetic. But I would go home and I would study the bow and draw it and make templates and then make three copies of each bow. Three weeks later, take it back, switch out bows. He would critique the work that I had done. And it was, uh, boy, it was like a factory. I've never worked harder in my whole life. It, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And there's no teacher in the world that can compare to Bernard Milan. When I came back from that wonderful experience, I cried all the way home <laughs> when I got back from that experience. Um, Arnold Bone was just about to retire, and I was asked if I would do the bow repair classes at UNH, which was a thrill. I was pleased that I could and, and, and inspired by the, these teachers that I'd had that were so good. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Bill Selko remarried. He, was, uh, he retired from his teaching in New Hampshire, and so I started doing his classes as well. So I started teaching there in 1990. And uh, things are still going strong. Things, the program there is bigger than ever. It's expanded in lots of different directions. I just want to say a word about Amanda on the left. She's a really fine teaching assistant. Um, it takes a special patience. It takes a special understanding and respect for the traditions. Uh, but it also, it takes a a real sense to encourage people every step of the way. And everybody in the class is so different. When you're working with adults, they have different skills and uh, different desires. Some wanna just do, do the class for the experience. Others wanna go home and start a business. So she helps me in a million different ways and she's just doing a fabulous job. She drives all the way up from Georgia to help out. These two pictures really sum up for me what I think the classes in New Hampshire are all about. It, it's a really relaxed environment, which is very good for learning. The picture on the left is Olivier Perrault and Paul Wiesmeyer, who teach classes there. This was a touch-up class, I believe, that they were teaching. Relaxed for them, they're such busy men, and they're under so much pressure in their daily business lives. For them to be able to just hang out together was such a relaxing and, and moving experience. And, it, and that rubs off on the students. The, the picture on the right-hand side is two students. The girl on the left had just made this bow, didn't know if it played, didn't know if it was a piece of junk, handed it to a guy who's just a wonderful Irish fiddler. And boy, did it play. Oh, we were all just thrilled to death to hear it. It was, it was great. I also teach out at Claremont Colleges. I have for a few years now, and I have two pictures here of a really talented student, Brianna Goldberg. Uh, California is wonderful. We can work outside so you can really see your work and things dry in just a fraction of the time that they do in New Hampshire. So Brianna was working hard on her bow. I think she was, it was a bow that she was making out of Ipe, 
and it had given her some trouble when she was bending, but uh, she, she persevered, she got it bent, and here she's putting French polish on it. And then the picture on the right makes me so happy because it's, it's the finished bow at rehearsal or concert, it looks more like a concert with her concert clothes on. And uh, it's a real bow. So congratulations to Brianna. So now welcome to, that's the end of the first third, the down memory lane third. Now you're in the welcome to Maine third. This is the tour of the back shop that I have. I have two rooms that I use for shops. It's an older house built in 1846 by a ship captain here in town, Captain J.C. Creech. And uh, it's traditional in Maine to have the house and then to have a barn and to have an L collecting, connecting it. It's a, just a long tube of a room connecting it. And oftentimes it was the, a kitchen on one side and it would be wood storage or food storage or even in very cold weather, animals would come in to stay warm. At any rate, the kitchen is on the right-hand side behind that brick wall. And this long skinny room is my shop. On the right-hand side of it is where I have all my storage. My supplies are kept down in those little cubbies at the back end. And then uh, my workstations, my workbenches are on the left-hand side. I have different stations where I do different things. Otherwise, everything was just piling up in one spot. The first workstation is for sharpening and uh, my grinder there for squaring up blocks. <clears throat> I have diamond stone and then I have some granite blocks that I have sticky back sandpaper on to do the finishing work a little jig to hold those tiny little blades that we use. The second workstation is where I do the messy work of planing sticks and carving frogs and bending sticks. I have a, on the front of the, let me go back to the picture on the left. I use a Stanley 102 or a 103 for that, something that's, uh, that's big and will take off the wood quickly. And uh, I also have a measuring gauge. You can see a little piece of that measuring gauge sticking out there. And that's, uh, that's just to help me get nice even graduations down the stick before I bend and then uh, after I bend when I'm doing my final graduations. And I think I stole that picture from Amanda. So if, Amanda, if you're there, great shot. <laughs> um, the picture on the right hand side is my bench and it has a bending block on the front, but the bending block is bolted on. So it can be there when I need it. I can take it off and then I can just work on frogs on the uh, flat block that's underneath that. The next station is for all the filing and sanding that needs to be done towards the very end. Each of these stations is by a window so that I can get the best possible light. But this is the one where I need that magnifier light that comes down and uh, so that I can really see if there are any tool marks. Very easy to miss tool marks on the side of the head. And so um, I, I always have to have the magnifier for that. The last workstation is the workstation that I use for French polishing. Uh, this is a bow that I just finished and I'm using linen rag, one rag inside another rag. I'm using uh, garnet um, shellac crystals mixed with alcohol in one container and then uh, either almond or walnut oil with it. So perhaps three to five coats, I would guess, uh, before a bow is finished. I have a small metric sherline lathe. You can see that on the right-hand side. That's all I need for bow making. Primarily, I make dowels on it and I make buttons. So I have a, a finished button, a button that I'm finishing up with micro mesh, which is just fancy sandpaper on a, a cloth backing and oil to just give it a nice feel. We never would use uh, French polish on frogs or buttons because it just would make them too slippery in the player's hands. The shop tour of the front of the house. This is Cody's house. My neighbor's children call this Cody's house. And there's Cody on the right-hand side. She's with me all day, every day. And I thank, I'm thankful that she is because it gets me to get up and move around and take her out for walks. Otherwise, I think I would be sitting all day, every day at my bench. My neck would be hurting, my back would be hurting, and it, it would, uh, I wouldn't be very happy. 
So this is the front of that house I was talking about. Two pictures of my bench in the front room. I love the morning light. The one on the left is what it looked like before COVID. It was just a place where I went to rehear bows. It was very peaceful. I just had my rehearing tools, had my toolbox, very calm. And then all of a sudden COVID struck and lessons needed to be done through Zoom. We needed to, I did a, a, something for the ISB. I had to do a 30 minute talk for bassists about uh, how to take care of their bows. So all of a sudden one light went to four lights on the laptop and books came on, wires everywhere. Uh, I have a camera on a big gooseneck hanging out over there and it's, it's elevated, not as elevated as it is normally when I'm teaching. Normally I try to get it up and over so that I can, uh, so that people can see down into my work. Um, but it felt very claustrophobic for me at first, and, and I wasn't liking the feeling. I didn't, uh, didn't know if it was really going to work for me. But then the students arrived, <laughs> and I was so happy that I had a granddaughter who was uh, technologically uh, inclined and so willing to help that she was able to get everything set up for me. The, the support team from the University of New Hampshire made it all very easy for us. And we had students from all over the world. And it was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. I had no idea if people were going to be able to learn in this way, but we made it work. And Manda Deegan over here on the right-hand side, who just had a little tiny table, it looks like she's in her laundry room or maybe a sewing room, a uh, little tiny table, uh, was able to create the the best rehairs and repairs in just a matter of a few days. She was just on fire with it and she still is. She's out there doing work for everybody in her, in Kansas where she's from. So it worked and I got used to all that stuff on my bench. The front shop is really just for clean things. You could see in the back room that there was oil and there was French polish and there was the, the dust that I was creating from the Pernambuco and from the ebony and from sanding, all of that dirty stuff, polishing, anything that I would do that would really mess up the hair, I like to do someplace else so that this bench stays super clean. And so rehairing is certainly one of the things that I do most at the front bench. But then there are other things that are also pretty easy to do that don't, that don't make a lot of dirt. Silver windings, leather grips, all, all of the different windings. These are all, the ones on the right are all silk. There's tinsel, which is a combination of silver and silk. There's whalebone, plastic whalebone. So those kinds of jobs I'll do up front. Everything else is in the back room. I just wanted to go through and show you just a few of the, how simple the tools are that we use. The, gouge that I use to <clears throat> fit the frog to the stick is a Swiss number five gouge, 25 millimeter. And I've reversed the grind on it so that it, uh, and put a burr on it. So it, it just drags along the that intersection of the frog to the stick and, um, and just slices, very carefully slices that off without damaging the stick. You'll see that I boosted it up with uh, the kind of stuff that people use when they've had strokes or when they have very serious arthritis. So I've boosted up the handle and I've also made a pad for my index finger because I was finding that that finger was uh, was hurting a lot when I was when I was working on frogs. And so I did what I could to adapt it. The handle is also cut in half. I've cut it right down on the bandsaw, cut it right down to the tine. Hopefully you don't hit the tine, but just beyond the tine, uh, you can cut that off and then you can push with the palm of your hand and that is also relaxing for your fingers. On the right hand side is a single bevel knife. It has also has a burr so you can see that it's just cutting like fuzz. It's not digging into the wood. It's not taking off big slivers. It's just fuzz. It's just uh, taking it off very, very gently so that I can keep that front line just as straight as possible. 
The planes and knife and chisels on the left-hand side are ones that I had to make that first summer when I went down and worked with Bill Salco. I thought I was just going to die. I'd never worked as a machinist before. I never wanted to, and I still don't ever want to. It was the most miserable experience. Um, I hated it, but there was no alternative. There was nobody making uh, planes that would have been appropriate for bow making, so I just did it. Since then, I've discovered, though, that as I age, that these steel planes are really too heavy for me, particularly the bigger, biggest one. <clears throat> and so I've made similar planes, same size, same design, but aluminum instead. And that's much easier for my hand. The knife is the same one that I've always used, and the chisels are the ones that I've always used. And on the right-hand side, we make lots of brass templates. This is the measuring gauge again, and then lots of different templates for different head models that I'm working on. We make spade bits. Uh, if you use twist drills to do anything in bow making, you're going to cut down the entire length of the twist. And the, the beauty of using these kinds of spade bits is that they only cut on the tips. And uh, so they're even if they're handmade and they look kind of crude, they still cut like a charm and it's wonderful. I work with the students on the anvil, my beloved anvil at Putnam Hall. The students uh, pound that till it's flat and then make a point and then go drill a hole in something. The, the spade bit on the left-hand side of the left-hand picture, it has all kinds of funny shapes to it because it cuts the Parisian eye. So it cuts the hole, the groove for the, the pearl and the silver, which you can see on the right-hand side of the, on my, my fancy super glue holder. Um, I was just practicing and made a little, little thing for myself. The one in the middle uh, of the three spade bits, I just used to cut out the throats on the frogs. And then the one on the right is one that would be used. It would just be going down flat. So that would be used for putting in the single pearl. I wanted to show you the name stamps because I don't know how many of you are makers or intend to get name stamps, but if, if you do uh, and order a, a name stamp, a steel stamp, you're going to get something that looks like the one on the top. And it's a disaster to try to use it. Uh, you have to heat it with a propane torch, so it gets quite hot. The collar gets hot as well. And so you're holding back behind it you're just kind of delicately holding onto the ball at the end of the handle. And it doesn't give you the kind of stability that you really need to get your name on there nice and straight. So I talked to the man at the company, Sosner Steel Stamp, and I said, I need something just really crude. I need a broom handle. Can you just mount my name stamp in a broom handle? And he did. And this is the, the most solid, most secure, most able, for me, most able to control stamp I've ever had. So if you are getting a name stamp from somebody, make sure that you have it mounted in that uh, broom handle. It'll really help. The tools needed for rehairing are just uh, pretty simple. You can, you can rehair anywhere. You can go sit at a picnic table and do your rehairs. I wanted to just mention the, uh, the rosin box because I, I just wanted I always thought it was very important, I still do think it was very, it is very important to use very fresh rosin with, there are so many things that people put into rosin in order to give it grip. And this is just very pure, no additives. I, it's Salco's light rosin. And I just crush that up and keep it in the box. <clears throat> but if, you, if you're using the old stuff that you find in violin cases, stuff that's been around for decades, it's going to be very dry and powdery. It's not going to sound good because it's not going to stick on the string very well. And it will just be falling all over the instrument and making a mess of the, the varnish on the instrument. So I recommend really fresh rosin. And then as you're looking through here, there's a little pair of pliers and all of my students know the story, but I'm going to tell them again so that I can tell all of you. Those little pliers that I use every single day and have for the last 50 years, uh, were given to me by my grandfather. I was four years old and there was a <clears throat> man from the, I lived in New York City with my 
grandparents and parents in the same house. And there was a man from the uh, telephone company, Bell Telephone Company, who came and he climbed up a pole and fixed something and he came down. And when he left, he accidentally had left these behind. Well, the kids in the neighborhood saw that and they grabbed them. They were fighting over them. All the, all the little boys in the neighborhood were fighting like dogs over them. My grandfather came out and grabbed them and he said, no, 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 no. These are for Lynn. She's going to need these. And sure enough, I have used them every single day of my adult life. And uh, I don't know how grandpa knew, but he knew. This is just two pictures, Bill Salco's hands and my hands. Um, just, to, just so that you know that it's, this is tough work on our hands. It's, very, it's a lot of squeezing. And there was a time, um, I can't even remember the dates, somewhere around 1990 probably, where I went back to college and got a degree. Uh, it was a, a self-directed degree of occupational and, and occupational therapy courses, physical therapy courses, anatomy courses. It was psychology courses even. It had to do with musicians' injuries. And so I learned that musicians have concerns, but they also have opportunities to do a lot in advance of having problems. And I think we do too, whether it's a violin maker or whether it's a bow maker, uh, we have an opportunity to stop, to stretch, to do all kinds of stretches, which I try to share with the students always so that they, they include that in part of their day. Bill and I are about the same age in these pictures. And he always thought my exercises were stupid, but his hands look like a hundred year old guy and mine don't. So I think I was, I think I was right. No bow goes out of my shop unless I've had an opportunity to play on it and really fine tune the uh, camber in the stick. It's very easy to have flat spots in the camber. And if you do, it's going to affect the sound and it's going to affect the feel in the player's hands. And so it's very important to make sure that that camber is absolutely perfect. And so I'll go to my bass, even if it's a violin or viola ball, I'll still take it to my bass and play it because I can see whether, whether the wood is going down evenly. Joey Neger on the right, just trying a bow out at UNH. He had the bass and I let him try it. And he pointed out a few things that were absolutely right. And I went and corrected them. And then the bow was finished after that. So it was, I love to have input of, uh, of players along the way too. <clears throat> and then you send them out and you hope like hell that they sell. And these two did. Very special players, very special. They've become very special friends now. And I think uh, that's, it's not always an easy thing to sell bows. It's more fun to make them <clears throat> than it is to sell them. But uh, boy, when you have wonderful people like this, it makes the job easier. Now I'd like to talk, last third, I'd like to talk a little bit about conservation because it's, it's Earth Day today and every day should be Earth Day. The International Pernambuco Conservation Initiative started in 1999. Uh, when, when the bow making community worldwide, which is really a pretty diverse group, people just spread out all over the country, not necessarily working with each other, usually pretty quiet, working in their own shops. Suddenly we all got the, the message that the, the deforestation in Brazil was so serious that the Brazilian government was considering an endangered species listing on Pernambuco. Well, we knew we needed to take action, but what in the world did we know about putting together a scientific research plan. Nothing, we knew absolutely nothing, but we came together anyway and wanted to give it a good try. And so the International Pernambuco Conservation Initiative, IPCI was formed. We came together and with the help of scientists in this country and in Brazil, we were able to put together a program that was accepted by the Department of Agriculture in Brazil. And that was that took two years, signed it the next year, and uh, we were able to avoid a more serious uh, listing, CITES listing, by taking such, uh, such an interest in the conservation of the species. 
The man on the left-hand side is really our saving grace, uh, Wade Thomas, a man who works uh, for the New York Botanical Gardens, but who has spent his entire career uh, doing research in the forests in Brazil and in the northeastern corner of Brazil. Not only was he able to tell us what, what was realistic, what was necessary for a research plan, how you, how you funded a research plan, uh, and then how do you transfer money from one country to another in a way that's safe and, and secure? Uh, so he was just uh, invaluable to us, very, very, very committed to his scientific work. This is me on the right hand side looking up at a tree that we had just discovered and I was looking up at it. I was so touched to find it. We'd been walking for hours and hours and I was busy watching my feet and one of the scientists said to me, you know, all the dangerous things are above your head. And I, I assumed he was talking about snakes and other scary things. And so I was, I looked up and then here was this beautiful Pernambuco tree, mature Pernambuco tree right in front of my face. So I looked up and I, I was so moved by it and it, it gave great meaning, meaning to what we were doing there. And I, I just looked up and wondered if we were gonna be able to do it. Were we, were we going to be able to protect the species? Was it going to go extinct? And I just made a commitment at that time to do whatever I could do to try to um, really work, work on it and convince other people of the need for action. When I stepped back away from the tree, one of the scientists said to me, were you, were you sizing it up to see how many bows you could make out of it? And I realized how little trust there was. Here we were from a different country and we were bow makers. So maybe we were just there to steal wood or get, get an insider's take on getting the wood at any rate. It took years for them to believe that we truly believed in conservation and that we really had the, the best interest of the forest at heart. That was really shocking to me. This is what it looks like inside the nurseries, all these little seedlings. Because we were involved with the Department of Agriculture, uh, these seedlings were going out in lots of different directions. Uh, some of them were going out and bow makers would never get get to see them ever again. They were going to civic plantings. Uh, Pau Brazil is their national tree. And so they're, they're very proud of it. So we were able to give, give seedlings to towns where they were putting up buildings. We were able to give them to national forests and, and reforests there. Uh, and we were able to provide, this was really exciting. We were able to provide work in these nurseries, these the people that are working in the nurseries are people who were, used to be out there cutting down the trees. So we knew that we needed to find jobs for them to do. And the seedlings were going out to farmers. The, this Department of Agriculture Center that we were working with worked with 20,000 farmers in the area. And we gave them seedlings. They didn't have to pay for them. They did have to sign up for them. They had to trace them and, and provide information as they were growing, but to provide these as uh, shade for cash crops. So these would grow and they grow very quickly. These would grow and they would provide shade for cacao or beans or whatever it else it was that the farmer could use uh, to make his money. And then these trees would be uh, a legacy to his children and they could be selectively cut if the, if the sons or daughters chose to do that. But um, it, was a, it was very meaningful to see everybody working together for the good of Pernambuco. It was wonderful. In this country, we had to raise money to make this all happen. And I came up with this idea that I thought was absolutely brilliant. I think I was the only person on the planet that thought this was brilliant because it didn't catch on. And I don't think I marketed it well. I don't think people understood it. And I think people felt they were too busy to do this. But what it is, is a sticker that you give everybody. So if I normally do a rehair for $75, I charge 76. So I add $1 to the cost of every rehair and that goes to pay for a seedling. So $1, one seedling. It keeps the seedling in the uh, nursery for
for almost two years so that it can be big enough and strong enough so that it won't be hurt by the leaf cutter ants that are out there. And at the end of the year, I, I have perhaps done 400 or 500 rehairs during the year. I write a check for 400 or whatever it is, send it off to IPCI USA, and that becomes part of their money for the programs. So I think these stickers are terrific. And anybody who wants to know more about them, I've got plenty and uh, lots of interest in sharing them with you. This is a little tree. This is what a two-year-old tree looks like on the left-hand side. So you can see how it goes from those little tiny seedlings to uh, this much stronger plant that we were able to plant. And if you look out into the field in the back, you'll see that we were planting everywhere. Well, that picture on the right with young chin is the same field. And it is full of good-sized Pernambuco trees. So this is the same the trees that were planted that looked exactly like the one on the left. And the trees in the back are cacao, the ones with the big leaves are cacao. So uh, that planting was very successful. And I'm assuming I haven't been down in a long time, but because I was caring for my mom, but I'm assuming that the other plantings are just as successful. So if anybody wants any more information, they can either contact me about it, I could talk all day long about it, or you can go to uh, the ipci-usa.org website. And there's another organization that's just starting up. It just, just got going before COVID. So that means not going very, very quickly. We've had to take a, a break right now. International Alliance of Violin and Bow Makers for Endangered Species. So we call it the Alliance. There is a, an international organization of violin and bow makers called ILA, the Entente Internationale. And they realized that Pernambuco was just a, a piece of the picture of our depleted forests, our depleted natural resources. They, they knew that for instrument making in particular, that that ebony was a serious concern. Was maple a serious concern? There were some people that were even asking about spruce. And so we knew that we had to look at a bigger picture and that makes me very excited because it is a bigger picture. And uh, this, is, this is an organization that I think will do wonderful work. Once we get rid of COVID, we'll be up and running. These are the representatives at our last meeting. We were there in uh, Cremona in 2019, representing 11 countries. And I just saw such sincerity and such uh, determination in all of these people. Every single person there was actively involved in coming up with ideas and taking, uh, wanting to take action, not just sitting there and letting somebody else do the work, but actually wanting to join in, wanting to take some responsibility. The guy in the back row, far left, is John Bennett. Keep, just keep an, a word out there. Um, the goals of the Alliance are representation, direct action, and education. And I'll just mention the importance of representation. That is John Bennett, the man I just pointed out to you, who is an independent environmental consultant. He was formerly the president of the Rainforest Foundation, so he has a lot of experience in Brazil in particular. But he has been representing our organization of violin and bow makers uh, at the CITES level, at the, at the UNA, U, United Nations CITES level for their endangered species listings. And he was absolutely invaluable to us with all the decisions that were made around ivory recently. Nobody wants elephants to be killed. But the scientists at CITES had heard that bows were made with ivory. And they assumed that that meant today, as well as historical bows. And he was able to go and explain to them that we are not just, a, not just an industry, but a culture of self-regulation. When bow makers were told ivory was out, don't use it anymore, whenever that was in the 70s, we stopped. People shifted over to mammoth or 
whatever, plastics, composites, bone, whatever material, but they, but they switched over. We did it with whale bone. We did it with tortoise shell. And so what was left was this organization that was self-regulating, trying their best to abide by those laws and this grouping of historical bows and instruments that needed to be protected. These needed to be cared for. We didn't want those going through and having parts picked off or having them damaged or destroyed. And suddenly CITES realized we, we weren't the problem when it came to that. And so what, what that means to me is that we were developing open communications and a respectful working relationship that we were all on the same page. We all wanted the same thing. We all wanted, we, we wanted to do good works. And so it's really important to, to have him representing us as we move forward. And when there are laws, he can make them clear to us so that we don't spend six months trying to figure out what is the law? What, what do we do? Where do we go? It, uh, it can be very confusing. So as of now, there, uh, this organization, and I don't speak for the organization, but I'm just, I'm just showing you some of the opportunities here. They do, rep they do uh, fund some of the research work that IPCI is doing in Brazil, which is wonderful. And there's a, another a German, <coughs> excuse me, German nonprofit called Ebenholtz working on ebony research in the northeastern corner of Madagascar. And you're going to hear much more about these, including other uh, opportunities for this kind of research. Here's one that's very interesting. Mats Turkelsen from the Royal Danish Embassy wanted to do a maintenance plan uh, uh, just to figure out whether or not we had a maple problem. We don't want to wait with maple. We don't want to wait until there suddenly is a, a real problem with the maple that is used for instrument making. And so to have a management plan in place to protect that so that we don't ever get so down the road as we have with Pernambuco and with Ebony that, uh, that we're struggling to, to find a, a reliable, sustainable source. So um, this, this will be a wonderful thing. He's, he's going to be doing his worldwide study and finding out where we are. And I'll be interested to see what the results are on that. I think education has got to be one of the most important things we could ever do. It's only that it's only when people know the problems and know the science can they uh, really find a way to take action, to join in and take action. So there was a presentation made to the students at the violin making school in Cremona. It was a, a wonderful opportunity to see the school, which has such history. But the students there were really concerned. They were concerned because they, uh, they didn't know about their own futures. They didn't know if there would be wood supplies that would be of the quality that they needed for their instruments. It was uh, very stressful for them. And their question always was, what can we do? How can we help? So young people have really got that drive to, to make a difference. And I really appreciate it very much. It was very meaningful. So for information and also to download a brochure, which we have available in four languages, you can go to the isla.org slash alliance slash website. And we're going to be changing this around a little bit. As I said, COVID put us out of, out of working on these programs for a little while, but uh, we're gonna have an Alliance USA branch for fundraising so that we can have a website and a donate button and uh, use of credit cards. Right now, the Alliance headquarters is in Switzerland, which makes it a little complicated for us. So uh, individual countries will have their own Alliance, uh, what are they? What are they, what are they, what are they? What are they? branches, I guess, branches of the same tree. And it, uh, I, I think it will run more efficiently then. And then just saying, let's make every day Earth Day. And here we are back again. Awesome. Are you ready to take a few questions?
Sure. Yay. First of all, that was great. Can I just say that was great? Everyone's muted, so you can't see them applauding and all that. <laughs> So, that would be too distracting. <laughs> so um, I am going to, um, because um, the first question I actually had was back to the beginning of your presentation, your first cello bow you made. Do you still have yeah. that bow? I do. I have it here. I lost the silver tip on it, but I have it. And I look at the spline and it still gets, gives me the spooks. <laughs> that was so, oh, that was so traumatic. <laughs> Um, as I ask her these questions, those of you guys that are um, that came in a little late, type your questions in the chat box. Um, if you have something that you want to ask out loud, we can unmute and do that too. Um, Eric Salazar, who was actually one of our clinicians a few weeks ago, he's a New York musician, and he has several questions. He wanted to talk about rosin, and he asked, what is the life expectancy of rosin? Um, Eric, are you a bassist? By no. Okay. Then, yeah. Um, you can usually tell if the rosin starts powdering up all over your instrument. Uh, base, mm -hmm. base rosin goes quickly. Pops rosin. Yeah, I, I, do, I play violin and viola, and I play a little bit of bass. So, so I could I could play Suzuki book one and two on bass. Yeah. I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, I think people should just chuck it after a year or two. Don't keep it around forever. You know how musicians have this contest to see how tiny they can get that little sliver of <laughs> rosin. Forget it, throw that away. <laughs> Don't go there. Unless it's really, really good rosin and bring it to me and let me grind it up and use it on the end of my bow hair. <laughs> there you go, that works. <laughs> um, he also wanna know what is the difference between dark and, and amber or light rosin? Uh, the dark just has a little bit more grip. So it's uh, better suited, I think, for cellos. And does your bow get stressed out if you use different types of rosin at one time? Uh, probably it does, yeah. I think you're just, uh, I, for, that's why I also like to use just a really good quality rosin so that nobody's going to scream at me for putting some junk on there. And then the rosin that they want to use just doesn't adhere to it very well. So uh, less is more when you're putting on powdered rosin, but uh, also I think just having a really good quality rosin really matters. So yes, I think going back and forth between different rosins can can mean uh, more frequent rehairs. Hey, more money for us, right? More money for us, cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Eric, you may need to um, clarify this because he wrote, do you need to wipe the rosin off the bow after you're playing? Are you talking about off the hair, sweetie, or off the stick, Eric? The hair. Actually both, yes, both the, the stick and the hair. I would wipe it off the stick, just like after you finish playing and you wipe your strings down and then you wipe whatever rosin is on the instrument and you clean that up a little bit. I do go and take it off the stick, just the underside of the stick, but I don't ever touch the hair. I, I think that uh, it's too easy to get greasy fingers on there or, or dirt. So just leave the hair alone. Um, by the way, Bob Townsend said, thank you. <laughs> I think he had to duck out. Um, yeah. Dan wanted to know why don't bows have serial numbers for identification? You know, there was some, there was a guy that came to the Federation of Violin and Bow Makers who had this little thing that looked like a, a piece of rice. And his idea was that we would just drill the screw hole into the stick a little tiny bit deeper and each bow would have their little microchip inside there and and everyone would everyone would know like microchipping your dog you'd microchip your bow but uh no no one has ever thought about doing that um, so Barry said what do you find is your biggest challenge these days as a bow maker my biggest challenge, age. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, age. You know, I have to just be more careful about getting up and stretching. I've got to get up and move my hands and my shoulders. I, I automatically pull my shoulders up high and I have to do that. So uh, pacing myself, 
maybe a little bit more than I ever did before. It used to be that I could work in the shop all day long and then I could go off and play whatever in the evening. So I, I was going all day, every day. And uh, it got to the point where we had a, some big, we were doing all the Brandenburg concertos and I got through, I don't know how many, maybe number two, got to a really long 16th note passage and I had just been planing bows all day long and my hands just froze. They were like stone. And I just thought, you know what? You can't do that anymore. Maybe that worked when you were 20 years old, but it's not working when you're 50, 60. So um, I, then I came up with the one third, two thirds rule. If I was doing a rehearsal or a concert at night, then I would only work one third. So morning was a third, afternoon was a third, and evening was a third. And so if I had some musical event that I needed to do, then I needed to cut back on the bow work. But it took severe pain for me to accept that. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and also selling bows because I like to know the people that have them. I've never, I've never been someone who just sent bows out to shops and let you know anybody sell them to anybody and then I lose track of them. And I never know whether the players are really uh, pleased with them, satisfied with them. I want to know the player and I want to know that they are happy with that bow. And if they're not happy with that bow, I want to trade in and get them something, get something into their hands that works better for them. And for kids, that's often the case because they might trade up and get a, a new instrument. They may change teachers. So their playing needs may change. And uh, I, I just don't, I don't wanna leave that, to, uh, that responsibility to a shop. My, re my reputation and my, my bows are, feel like children to me. So it feels more like an adoption service than a business. Um, Hong wants to know, what is your opinion about rehearing from the tip or from the frog? I learned both ways, but I think I prefer going from the tip to the frog. And, but the thin hair needs to be at the tip and the thick hair needs to be at the frog end because that's the end that takes the, the greatest hit with our hands. You know, we have the force of our hands and our arms. And so that needs to be the strongest hair at that end. So it's really the direction of the hair that matters more. The, also the, the re-hairing from the frog to the tip, uh, you, you do you put the hair into the frog and then you do a twisting motion to the hair so that you can fit the pearl slide over the top of it. Um, but I noticed when I was trying it that way that often the spreader wedge even though I had a the dot of glue holding it in place, would pull out because the hair wasn't tight. The hair would pull it out. And so I just think it's a better uh, end product going from tip to frog. So would you talk a little bit about the differences? Because you your education is French-based, French making. So how do the Germans approach making differently or the English than the French? Mm -hmm. Well, there were some fine German makers that, uh, that came and studied in Paris. Frechner and Nuremberger and Schuster were all French trained makers, but the, the, there was just a difference in philosophy. The French started their education as young boys out in the country, out in Mircourt. Uh, they were coming in from the mustard fields to work in the, in the factory. And they were selected by body size. They were, these were people who had delicate fingers and they were able to manipulate the tools. The big strong kids would be out building walls or working on the farm. So they, they divided up the jobs in that way. Once they'd start there at eight or nine years old. And, and then, so by the time they were teenagers, they would be master makers. They would move then to the big shops in Paris and they would work directly selling bows to the musicians. And it, they were just, these bows had to play. They, had, they just had to meet the needs of the musician. The Germans decided instead that they wanted to go into the, the mountains in Bavaria and start their own factories there and uh, make masses of bows, make more bows. 
The French makers didn't make that kind of volume. They made one bow at a time. The, the German makers often um, were thinking about making lots more than that and, and making them for uh, export. So it's just a different philosophy. The, the English, what to say about the English? Their bows are beautiful and, and clean and neat, and um, they, they met the playing needs at that time. I, I think they were more closely in line with the French philosophy. The tubs and the Dodd bows are really elegant, beautiful bows. And then there's the Yankee, then there's the Yankee school of bow making, as people <laughs> used to call it. And that's that's all of us. <laughs> Um, it's it, I just in, it's interesting because I've seen several classes that use a great deal more machinery than we did in your classes, and I don't know if it's true or not. I always thought of your classes as being French method, <laughs> you know, like like not carving out everything thing with a machine, but doing so much of it with those simple tools: planes, knives, chisels files. That's very true. Yes, that's very true. Uh, Paul Schubach is a wonderful cello maker who lives out on the West Coast. And uh, Paul studied, did a, an apprenticeship with Rene Morizo in the 60s. And even in the 60s in Mirkor, you had to take your little scooter and go across town to get to a bandsaw. And there were no there were no power tools in the shop for either violin making or the Morizo brothers for their for their bow making. They just uh, they just used their hand tools. So the 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 there was a tournier. There was a man who who was a turner on the lathe. So you wanted button work, you went in one direction. You wanted your wood sawn, you go in another direction. But but right there in your shop, there were hand tools, and so I. I said to Bill, Bill came from a machining background because his father worked in Detroit in the, in the automobile industry and he loved machines. And so he was very innovative and he was always looking for new ways to do things. And I kept saying to him, how did you learn it when you were with Barjanet? How did, how did you do that when you were in France? And so I think I was able to pull from him all of the authentic French uh, techniques. And they're and they're not precise. Then it's not everything square and and clean and neat, but certainly beautiful and elegant and and so valuable these days. And they play. <laughs> oh yes, that too. And they play. <laughs> Simon wanted to know how do you divide your work time up between rehairs, repairs, and making. I uh, this is I I took it took a pandemic to get me to smarten up and get organized. I have one day a week that I do rehairs. I have one day a week where I do repairs. The rest of the time, I spend I I do Zoom, paying the bills, a longer walk with the dog than normal. So Wednesday is sort of a, a quiet day. Thursday and Friday is to set aside exclusively for bow making, and it took me. 50 years to figure out that I could do that. I was always trying to people please. I was running a business and if a musician said to me, I'm gonna be passing by on Thursday at nine o'clock, I would say, oh, okay, I'll be here. Well, now I say, I do my rehears on Tuesday. What time can you come? <laughs> and you know what? Nobody has complained about it. I was the only one that was dancing around in circles trying to make everybody happy. And it really, it wasn't necessary at all. It was just my insecurities, I guess. And I wanted, I wanted, uh, it was either insecurities or it was just, I needed the money and therefore I would just do whatever I needed to do to make that money, the, the quick money that you make in repairs, quicker money than you make in repairs. But now that I have this other routine, people don't even, don't even bother with telling me when they can come by. Now they ask. When are you available to do this work? So I, I, I'm getting older and I'm getting smarter. How about that? <laughs> well, and that actually goes <laughs> to um, Broner's question too, because he had asked, how did you find a balance between base practice and bow making back when you were in school? 
Well, I just uh, I just fit it in. I just was energetic and I was uh, impassioned to do both. So when everybody else was hanging around doing whatever they were doing, I was practicing. <laughs> and uh, and also it's it's really the same muscles. You know, it's the same squeezing that you're doing when you're working on bows that you're doing when you're holding the neck or holding the bow. Identical. I worried about that once coming from UNH. Nine weeks of, of eight hours a day of, of making bows. And then I had to play an opera. And I thought, I wonder if I'm going to just fall on my face in this opera because I haven't had any time to practice. Well, my hands were so strong. And I was just ready to go when I got to it. So I really think the two work very well together. You know, it's funny. Everyone here um, knows what it's like to remember the words of a teacher. And you would be shocked how many times I'm speaking to somebody and you're, what you say comes out of my mouth. And I, try, and I always... I always quote you, but that is something I never forget, forgot you saying when we asked you in class. We said, what do you do when you play? Because a lot of us are musicians and repair people or makers. And you said, they will work. They will help each other if you do it right. Yeah, they really do. But you still have to be working. You still have to be working to relax your muscles. You need to, you really need to take care of your muscles. I think Oren O'Brien was a, an inspiration to me in that aspect as well, because uh, she she trades off instruments and trades off bows so that she's not always using the same muscles over and over and over again, but she's giving her body a chance to rest uh, in between there. So I think that's an important thing for us to remember. And just little things like, you know, putting your hands behind your back as I'm doing right now, instead of this constant letter C that we do with our back and our shoulders and our necks, uh, makes a world of difference. If you, if you make a commitment to do that every day, it, it will make a tremendous difference. Does anyone else have any questions? Do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask it live? You are welcome. I can't see most of you because I because I've got speaker view on. So you're going to have to just do it, and you can interrupt me. Um, it's not a problem. <laughs> um, while we're seeing if anyone else has any more questions, um, is UNH class happening this summer? It is. All of the classes are happening this summer. You know, UNH has grown so over the years. It's got guitar repair now, and it's got bass repair now, and. And Phil Cass comes and does a, a class on uh, identification and varnishing and making. I'm going to forget something. Lots of bow classes. It's just uh, it's grown into into a big event. With lots of classes going on for four weeks, filling up just about every room in Putnam Hall. And uh, so last year we were just not sure we were going to have it at all. And we decided to give it a try to go virtual. And it was such a success that this year, again, we were assuming we were going to be back on campus. The university was saying they would allow their summer classes to work. And then that, that meant the camps, the kids' camps, whether it be basketball or soccer or whatever. But they couldn't guarantee housing or, or food. And so, that went for a little while and we didn't feel very good about that. And then suddenly the university just shut it down completely. So the, the decision wasn't made by the program. The decision was made by the school and I'm glad it was done that way. It's a safe, the safer way to do it. So we'll just do this year exactly what we did last year. And uh, it's wonderful because we, we do have students that come from all over the country who otherwise wouldn't, have, wouldn't be able to afford to come to UNH. And we also had the opportunity to work with uh, younger kids. We had a 14 year old girl from Northern California who was just a superstar. She was absolutely amazing. My granddaughter joined in at 16. And these are kids who wouldn't be allowed in, in the classes on the campus. Anybody under 18 wouldn't be allowed. So it, it allowed a lot, of, a lot of people from Spain from Hong Kong, from where else? Um, Turkey, all over. It was really a good experience. 
Well, my last question is, and it's kind of a strange one, but you'll understand, because you were so close to Bernard Malant, um, and did you, were you able to get any of his bows when they auctioned off his collection? I was not. I'm, I'm sorry about that. You deserve one more than anybody's. <laughs> no, I just have my memories, but they're, uh, he was a special man. Yes, he was. I got to meet him several times and both times he went on and on about Lynn Hennings. It was great. Oh. <laughs> he always called me the, the son that he never had, which is sort of a funny thing for him to say. But I, I learned over the course of time that he had a son that died very young. I think it was within his the little boy's first year, died of polycystic kidney disease. And it it's such a tradition in the family to pass it on, to train and to pass it on to the next generation as it was passed to him. And so there was a lot riding on having this young boy grow up and, and take over. And so he only had his daughter. His daughter had no interest whatsoever in the business. She wanted to restore and, and does still today do a beautiful job of restoring antique furniture and selling it at different uh, Marseille de Puce flea markets. And, uh, and so the, the business was going to die or it was going to be sold off to somebody else as it was. It was sold off to the Le Canoes. And that, was a, that is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing that happened. But it wasn't what he ex expected. And so when I came along, I came along at a time when he had just retired. He didn't know what in the world to do with himself because you knew how energetic he was. And he just never sat still for two seconds. And so he poured his guts out into teaching me. I, I became his project for that year. And he just, he so often said that uh, it, this was what he wanted to give his son. It was, I always thought that was so touching. He was Sartori's family. His mother's side of, of the family was Sartori. Well, you can't beat that for a lineage, that's for sure. No, that's for sure. <laughs> um, and Lisa asked, what is your favorite part about what you do and what is the hardest part? My favorite part. Um, I would have to say carving heads is my favorite part. I could do that all day, every day. I just love, I love carving heads. The hardest part for me would be bending base bows these days. And that's a, that's a challenge. The sticks are at their thickest. They're two millimeters oversize when you're bending them. And uh, boy, I can feel it in my thumbs. I can, my thumbs can actually go numb if I'm pressing too hard for too long. And so um, it's no secret, Barry has offered me uh, a bender that his dad used. Sam uh, made wonderful bows uh, for many, many years. And so, Barry was cleaning up the shop and that called me and asked me if I wanted to have this bender. And I thought, ah, oh, my hands are going to survive for another 20 years. Thanks to you, Barry. <laughs> I have a project coming up with Barry and I'll, I'll let you in on it. We haven't told anybody yet, but it's, it's such a treat for me. It's, it, it's so exciting for me. Sam Colstein was a wonderful man, a talented man, talented musician, incredibly creative and artistic in his work. And uh, when he died, he left behind partially finished bows. And they're beautiful. They're gold mounted and it might be uh, really exotic woods. Uh, some of them are, are almost finished. They're, they're just ready to put hair on them. They're so close. And so um, Barry and I are working on a project now to get those bows finished up. I'm going to finish them. We're going to stamp them with Sam's name and my name. And uh, that will just be my thanks to Sam for his support over the years. He was very kind to me, very supportive when a lot of other people weren't. Uh, there was a lot of sexism that I had to deal with over the years. Sam looked at my bows and looked at me and he said, you're good at this. And that was the greatest compliment I could ever get. He was sort of a little gruff at that moment in time. And I, I didn't know what he was gonna say. He looked at my bow, put it down on the table and walked away. And then he came back and said, you know, you're good at this. And it, it was 
it was so reassuring for him to do that. I'll never forget his support. And uh, to, to be able to make these, we couldn't figure out what to call them, Sammy Linbos. <laughs> we, we couldn't come up with the right name for them. So it's gonna be my name stamp and his, uh, his uh, sign, his little SK on the bows as well. And I'm just about ready to start on my number one of those. So that'll be just great. Thank you, Barry. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Barry. Cause you know, us bass players in the world, I don't know what we would do without you guys. So. <laughs> no. Maybe Barry, Barry wants to come to my next series of classes. <laughs> That'd be <Sure>. awesome. <laughs> and then we, oh, can all, we can all ask Barry what he does with all his time. He must just be bored to death with all his free time. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm 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 retired, but not retired. <laughs> no, I, I retired from running the shop about a year and a half ago. Uh, was fortunate enough to have one of the young people that worked for me, Manny Alvarez, took over the shop. But I stayed on with the as I'm still on as a senior consultant for the shop. But it's allowed me to go back to the bench. So uh, very similar situation to what my dad did when I took over the shop, where he went back to the bench, and I think he did some of his best work and ideally I'm going to do some of my best work in my remaining years but it sure is nice to work with you Lynn and have you as such a good friend I'm very honored and blessed so I get to see that bender on Sunday it's coming up with a friend I get to try that out the cooker <laughs> pictures on Facebook pictures on of course, of That's course. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so speaking of honored and blessed, Lynn, seriously, we're all honored and blessed and um, that you did this and that you're, but throughout the years that you've been so sharing and open with your knowledge and um, yet yeah, thousands of us have benefited so much from it. And, you know, so more will, in the, so many more will in the future. So <laughs> um, any of you guys that are here that, um, that her website Tell them your website. LAHBows.com. The tools are the best. Um, I, you know, I think there's probably at least a good 20 of us that are on this call that would just fight each other for saying how great the classes are. So if you've never taken any of these classes, I highly recommend them. Like all you guys should like put your little smart, what is it called? A little hand icon or something. <laughs> There's a bunch of us on here. Um, but I just want to say thank you again. A lot of people, man, they, they just want to pull up that ladder when they have some knowledge, they don't want to share it. And you've just been so awesome. So thank you very much. I've had the best teachers in the world and it's been a pleasure to share with all of you over the years and tonight. And now it's bedtime. And now it's bedtime. For, <laughs> for you guys, before I turn off the recording, don't forget, ne next Thursday, it's our last class in this series of eight. Um, I like I like to say, for you older people, same bat time, same bat channel, 7.30 <laughs> next week. We have Ann Hobbs, the amazing cellist. She's going to talk about all kind of different practice methods to help us get the best out of our time. So thank you guys all, right, all for you. being here. See ya. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn.